Amazing gift, amazing grace, the Word of God. As the author of Hebrews puts it, for the Word of God is living and active, living and active, living. As Jesus says, the Word that I speak to you are spirit and life. And indeed, our God does everything by speaking. It is in His speaking that He calls us out of the darkness of sin and death and the power of devil. It is by speaking that He comes to us, indwells in us, creates in us new hearts, unites us with Himself, and gives us the gift of eternal life in His kingdom of everlasting joy and blessedness. His Word does bring us true life and and wonderful hope. And the Word of God is also active. Yes, He is. <laughs> we come here responding to Jesus' invitation. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We come as beggars to Jesus, with nothing to offer, trusting in His grace and mercy, and He he welcomes us. He speaks and His Word, His Word actively works in us. His Word discerns and exposes the thoughts and intentions of our very hearts. Like a skillful surgeon, He removes what is wrong with us. He restores and makes us spiritually well again. He blesses us in countless ways as we simply rest in His presence, while He serves us, while He serves you. And all of this happens week out and, and week in, if we listen to this living and active Word. If, if, as most of you already know, last weekend something of immense significance took place in the LCA Synodical Convention. With 71% support, the Way Forward framework was accepted. What does this mean? And I tend to agree with those who say that the LCA, as we knew it before, does not exist anymore. Something new has taken her place. We have decided to stop listening to what the Word of God says about the office of the public ministry, about pastors. But that is only the tip of the iceberg. This decision con confirms that different parts of our church listen to different authorities, to culture instead of Christ, to the world instead of the Word. It is about different understanding about our salvation about different understanding about the church. It is about different gospel and about different priorities for the church's mission. And the concerning trends that we have been reflecting on in our congregation the last year were on display at this convention. We have spent 18 months, $900,000, Countless hours of efforts all around the LCA for what? To deceive ourselves that the way forward framework is something new. As Dr. Stephen Halgred from Australian Lutheran College put it, there is essentially nothing new in this whole project. We have voted on almost exactly the same before. This was already the sixth time. Our leaders kept assuring us that nothing will change, even as they clearly knew that was not true. As one pastor jokingly put it, do not worry, the bathtub will remain almost unchanged. We will only remove the plug. The following morning after this decision was made, Pastor Timothy Teuscher, 
the president of the Lutheran Church of Canada, our closest international friends for many decades, our closest friends, with sadness announced that they have no other option than to recognize that the LCA action has severed the bond of fellowship between us. Yes, we did it. We did it. The International Lutheran Council has made clear their position that they are not in fellowship with those church bodies that act against God's commands. The International Lutheran Council unites all those Lutheran churches from all continents who believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And with the yes vote on the way forward framework, the LCA has decided that we do not want to have you as our Christian friends anymore. Some may argue that those international Lutheran council churches are not perfect either. <laughs> Amen to that. And I would go even further. I would say that those are the only Lutheran churches that clearly recognize that they are not perfect, that they are sinful and unclean. And that is why repentance and forgiveness is at the very heart of what they preach and teach. Meanwhile, for those churches gathered under the umbrella of Lutheran World Federation, repentance and forgiveness, that's not their favorite message. It's all about acceptance, inclusivity, social justice, with very little room for the need for repentance. But on the bright side, those Lutheran churches that believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that we are sinners in need of repentance and forgiveness have made it clear that they will do whatever they can to support the faithful remnant in Australia. The faithful remnant. And that is a wonderful and encouraging commitment. A number of pastors, of our pastors, already have informed their bishops that they cannot any longer be involved with wider LCA activities. Some are leaving the LCA as we speak. Many are considering what faithful course of actions will look like in their situation. Members of the LCA congregations who want to remain faithful to the Lord Jesus and His Word are looking for opportunities to join another Lutheran Synod. And there are many questions being asked by our brothers and sisters. How do we commune? Where do we commune? Can we still commune in our congregations if our pastor is for the way forward framework? Can we still commune in our congregations remaining in the LCA? And so on. And that is just the first week after the convention. Things have changed in a profound way and will continue to change more than we know. As the Spirit spoke through Paul the Apostle, warning those who do not want to recognize God's ordering for His church, if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. And you know, I, I am puzzled. I am. How could we do this? How could 71% of delegates have ears but not hear? How could they harden their hearts and despite so many calls to listen to the word? Perhaps the 900,000 campaign paid by our donations was so effective. And for me, this is a mystery of, of God. Why can some of our Christian brothers and sisters see clearly what is going on and why some cannot? Why? 
And among those who voted for the Way Forward framework, there are people more knowledgeable, more educated, more experienced, more caring, more gracious, more active, more passionate for the mission of the gospel. And God alone knows more faithful to His word and His callings in ways that, for example, I am not. We may be tempted to think, thanks be to God that we are not like them, that we are so faithful that we are better and more committed to the Scriptures. May such thoughts be far from us. May our Lord Jesus Christ be gracious and cut such arrogance and pride out of our hearts. Our God tells us that we all are through and through sinful. There is no one righteous, no one who seeks God, not a one. We are in God's church not because of some qualities or abilities in us, but only because of His grace, only because He has spoken His living and active word to us. It is only by God's grace that some can discern what others cannot. We did not merit it. We did not deserve it. And it's not because we are better. None of that. It is because of our God that He is in His wisdom guides everything to the smallest details. And Yes, for me, this is a mystery of God. How could we do that? 71%. But it is Him, our all-wise God, who guides His church and the entire history of the world and the lives of each one of us to the smallest details according to the best possible scenario. Yes, according to the best possible scenario from His divine perspective. What happened last Saturday was, from God's perspective, the best scenario. Think about it for a while. The situation we are in is the best scenario from God's perspective. <laughs> He works with imperfect beings, fallen, corrupt, wounded, hurt, foolish, rebellious beings living in this broken world. And from us, He is building His kingdom that will endure forever. And He uses all of us for His glorious purposes. And yes, it is, it is His mystery why He reveals His will clearer to some and not so to others. And no one can boast that we have earned His blessings with our faithfulness. But we have to ask, we have to ask this question, what must we do with the abundance of grace that we have received? What must we do with the life-giving message that He has spoken to us? What must we do with everything the Lord has entrusted to us? And remember Jesus' words, everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required. And to us much is given. To us much is given. There is no time for indifference. There is no room for complacency. What must we do? How are we to remain faithful to our Creator and Redeemer? These and other questions are before us. <laughs> and we will need to see God's guidance to answer them sooner than later. We need to pray and ask, Gracious Father, we know that you want to bless us through everything that is happening. 
please help us to discern what you want us to do. Show how you would use us to bless as many as possible with your living and active word. Help us, Father. Help us. Concluding, concluding our meditations, brothers and sisters, hear this. Hear this, how the Spirit speaks through, through the author of Hebrews. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. What does this mean? We often speak about how we are united with Christ in our baptism. But I suspect that we mostly think only, only in one direction, how we are united with Him. But remember, He is also united with us. He is united with you. Whatever you experience, He experiences. Whatever challenges you face, He faces with you. He not only understands you, He feels what you feel. He suffers with you. He knows exactly what it means to live in this sinful and broken world where nothing functions as initially designed. And that's Him, the Lord who dwells in you. He invites us. He invites you. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Your Lord invites you. And we know that our Father in heaven is pleased with us because of what Jesus did. And today we can with confidence draw near to His throne with our prayers. And we know what we will receive. Something that we do not deserve. Something that we fail to appreciate. God's mercy and grace to help in our time of need. And that's what we need. That our faithful Father keeps us in true faith and guards us from our own sinful thoughts and desires which we cannot even understand. That He guards and keeps us from all falsehoods and temptations of this world around us and the evil one, which we struggle to discern on our own. That He blesses us richly with His spirit of truth and peace and joy and hope that the light of His living and active word dispels all the darkness that is in us and around us. That He cuts out those, that arrogance and pride from our hearts and enables us to take up our crosses and to follow our Lord Jesus Christ wherever He leads us. For that is what we need. And that is what our Lord abundantly gives to us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.